And so you can still see in four corners in the southwestern states that green stuff on the ground is actually the temperature of the snow and it's not going anywhere. Okay? Here's that fog bank in the Central Valley of California. It's about the same temperature as the ground and so it's almost invisible in infrared. So infrared's not always, this kind of infrared's not always the greatest to see fog with. There, like I said, there's other ways. Okay, now, right in northwest Ar um, Arizona, and you see that little patch of green? Watch it when it comes up again. That's the southern rim of the Grand Canyon. And it snows a lot there. And the north rim is up here, and it snows a lot there. Elevations are seven to eight, 9,000 feet. But the Grand Canyon itself is a mile deep in places. Remember what I said, you lift air and it tends to, the temperature tends to cool off. Descending air, the temperature tends to warm up, it gets compressed. In the summertime, in the bottom of the Grand Canyon, it can be 30 degrees warmer than it is on the rim. People die in the bottom because they don't know it's going to be 115, 120 degrees down there because the air is slipping over the side and descending and compressing and warming. You can see that in this imagery. Here's the southern, let me focus this in. Here's the southern rim. It's got that snow field, it's very cold. Here's the north rim, and there's a little blue squiggly line in the middle, see that? It's warmer than this. The blue temperatures are warmer than the green temperatures. That's the Colorado River Canyon, the Grand Canyon. So in the infrared, you can actually see terrain features, which again, I'm a map geek, so I love that kind of stuff. Um, my, it drives my wife nuts. I'm like, look at this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. This is such a big cloud field that it's very difficult to find up in the northwest part of the United States. It's very difficult to find any jet streaks or little cloud elements moving more quickly through there. Um, but in general, there's, there's probably one coming down this side of, that, of this upper ridge down through four corners and things. And another one coming up through here, through the Gulf of Mexico up in our area. Okay, let me move on to this next one. We'll answer some of those other questions. This is the third type of, of basic water vapor imagery that we use, and it's water vapor. The satellite can actually detect the emittance of wavelengths that water vapor emits. And that, if I had to pick one, if they came to me today and said, Brian, you need to throw out and quit using all types of satellite imagery except one. You get to pick one to keep. Which, which one do you want to keep? I would keep water vapor. And you'll see this on the news, they're showing it more and more, which is a good thing. It measures the wavelength emitted by water in the middle and upper atmosphere, not the lower, just the middle and upper, which is okay. That's a bit of a limitation. We can't see the low level stuff, but we can see the major storm systems. We can see little wiggles that make the size of the state of Tennessee, which make a huge difference in our weather, but are almost impossible to see on visible or infrared. Um, it's very useful at night or day. It's very useful for tracking the path of tropical moisture. And it's possibly the most useful. Arguably, some people might use something else, but I would take this if they twisted my arm. And this is what it looks like. Now again, it comes in a color scale by default from white to black, or mostly shades of gray. But I've, I've used a different one that they developed this color scheme they developed in Salt Lake City because it shows wavelengths that indicate colder tops and wavelengths that indicate lower or drier. Brown on this, brown-ish, is dry air out here. This is very dry air. Even though it's over the ocean, the air is dry. This is wet air. The green stuff has been lifted and lifted and lifted to the point where it's saturated and very moist. Okay. So here's our storm system. This starts from, this goes day or night. You can see this imagery. Our storm system goes through almost the whole cycle as it's approaching the state. It's in the West Tennessee. We start to get some big cloud tops over East Tennessee. It rains real hard, then it moves out of the area. Now look at this fetch of moisture. We call it a fetch when it's a long stream of it. Remember how invisible it went to the Mexican coast? Remember how in infrared it went down here somewhere? Well, the water vapor is showing that it actually goes out well into, almost to the equator. Well out past, well, to Hawaii. I couldn't, I could not save 
the images for the north, northern hemisphere view. But the northern hemisphere view shows that this fetch of moisture that hit us, that rained on us, extended almost all the way back to the Philippines. And so, yes, your question about can you see transport from other areas of the globe, it's implied, especially in the water vapor. You can see that the winds are transporting moisture from between, you know, somewhere near Tahiti <laughs> in, the, in, the, in Guam, in the Pacific, south of Hawaii, all the way past Mexico, into the Gulf of Mexico, and up into Tennessee. That air came from somewhere else, didn't come from here. So imagine in the Philippines, you get Mount Pinatubo erupting. Was that 1992? 90? 92? And that stuff, it circled the world. Krakatoa circled the world. Tambora circled the world. St. Helens circled the world. Not as badly or as quickly, but it did. I was in Denver. I lived in Denver at the time uh, St. Helens went up. And within uh, you know, a day or so, I had an eighth of an inch of sulfuric acid dust on my car. And they told us, don't use water because it turns it to acid. And don't brush it off because it'll scratch the paint. <laughs> OK? Buy a new car. What do I, yeah, what, buy a new car. What am I supposed to do? So I left it on there for a week and drove around real fast, you know, <laughs> trying to get it off. Finally, I went out with a little brush and just kind of brushed it off. And I left a few little streaks in my paint. You know, I was trying to be real careful, you know, but it was my dad's car, so I don't have to worry too much about it, but still. My daughters do that to me, so I can worry about it now. Okay. Well, anyway, I wanted to show you that there's a couple other little things here. Remember, our terrain, we see no terrain features anywhere because it's masking the ground completely. But for weather forecasting, that's okay. For map geekery stuff, that's disappointing. But for forecasting, this is a great set of images. Now, up here, look at this little tiny wiggle. You see how that? starts to wiggle. This is a major wave in the atmosphere because it's producing this stuff that hit us, but it's got that little wiggle in the middle. That's just a little thing, right? Who cares? It's so tiny. Yeah, look at that thing. Look how big it is. That is roughly the size of half the state of Tennessee. That's not such a little wiggle from our point of view. That thing's pretty big. But look at the grand scheme of things over the whole quarter of the northern hemisphere that we're looking at. That's a very tiny thing. So to forecast, let's say that little, a little wiggle like that were to hit East Tennessee. Very difficult to watch. And sometimes they appear almost out of nowhere and then disappear in the water vapor imagery. And as they cross the state, they wreak their havoc in 12 hour period and then move on. I'll give you an example. I, when I worked in Oklahoma, uh, I remember it being September 2nd. 1989. I'll never forget this date. September 2nd, okay? Summertime, right? Hot. Oklahoma's probably 105 degrees. Humidity's out the roof. We're watching water vapor, and there was a cold front that came down out of Canada and kind of, I'll show you, kind of was shaped like this, very cold for that time of year, and kind of slid into northeast Colorado right here, up against the Rockies, and here came the water vapor over the top of it, this water vapor imagery, and this jet streak, which you can look down here and see some of these elements moving a little faster. See that? They move fairly quickly and then they kind of disappear. That's a jet stream. A little jet streak moved over the top of the Rockies right near Denver and created one of those little tiny wiggles right over Denver and dropped a foot of snow on September 2nd, 1989. And did they forecast it? No. And so what do you think everybody said? <laughs> okay. Well, the Weather Service had responsibility for forecasting that. The TV stations can forecast it or not. It's up to them. They can use our forecast or they can not. That's, that's the thing. And we cooperate with them very well. In our area, we have a great relationship with all the media. But for warnings, warnings come out of the National Weather Service. And it's their responsibility to broadcast them, or on NOAA Weather Radio, or on the internet. But the media can broadcast, but they can't warn by law. Somebody has to warn and be responsible for that. 